Welcome everyone to the WrestlePod. Subscribe now for more pro wrestling and pop culture content. You asked me five years ago, even when we got brought into WB together, if, if this would have happened, I, no one could predict this. I think we both know where this is leading. When it's said and done, people will be talking about it for years to come. When success is measured solely by how one stacks up against a single competitor, it can lead to a preoccupation that turns on the blinders to other competitive threats. By focusing on only beating our rivals, are we holding ourselves to the highest standard of greatness? If we pay too much attention to the outcome of beating a rival, we may forget about the process of how to get there. This can be discouraging and lead to feelings of hostility, resentment and envy. Rivalries are important for competition, but if taken too far, they can be detrimental. In the glittering world of professional wrestling, fierce fights between two bitter rivals are a core fundamental and the very foundation of the business. Throughout wrestling's history, we've been lucky enough to witness epic encounters between the likes of Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes, who sold out arenas around the US in the 1980s. Later, children around the world cheered on Hulk Hogan in his battle with long-term rival Andre the Giant. More recently, we've witnessed iconic moments shared between Kazuchika Okada and Kenny Omega in Japan as they sought to revolutionize what a rivalry could be in pro wrestling in the modern era. With these wrestlers building stories which revolve around the core idea of building up a feud and maintaining a back and forth competition which spans months and sometimes even years, all in the aim to attract crowds and generate interest in their matches. In the current day of WWE, there has been no greater rivalry in my opinion than that shared between the two incredible performers whom are the topic of this video today. Two talented men who have gone above and beyond to deliver a story, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. See, I think a lot of people talk about Triple H and Shawn Michaels when they talk about me and Tommaso, which is the ultimate compliment for both of us. It's two guys who are just made to wrestle each other. I think we need to either team, wrestle, or just be paired together because we're just so polar opposite and so different in certain ways. We also have the same mind and the same way of going about things. It's also like we're a perfect match for one another, both in the ring and out. I cannot say this enough, we are completely opposite human beings. You look at us and we look like opposites, but as people too, we are opposite human beings, but we have the same wrestling mind. I think that really is the perfect combination there where we bring out the best in one another, whether we're teaming in the ring, telling a story or a promo. The closing moments of NXT TakeOver New York on April the 5th, 2019. A fan favorite athlete wins a career defining match to gain his first main championship in the promotion he has been fighting in for almost half a decade. His wife and fellow wrestler joins him on the entrance ramp at the brand's biggest show of the year. Through the pageantry, the bright lights and the screaming crowds, a momentary break of bravado allows his best friend to join them on the stage and share a heartfelt and emotional celebratory hug. This moment of real humanity was both simultaneously joy-filled and heart-wrenching, a culmination of a decade-long story filled with glory brotherhood and deceit, one of the greatest ever told in the wrestling industry. And here's why. When they chanted Johnny wrestling, he didn't seem to complain. He didn't have any, any problem, you know, and when they started chanting for Psycho Killer or Daddy's Home, he started to weigh on him a little bit. Uh, and I, I, I get it because when they chanted Johnny wrestling, it bothered me a little bit and I had to kind of separate us and make my own name for myself and, and create my own path. Two exceptionally gifted entertainers, Johnny Gargano, known amongst his fans as Johnny Wrestling, an Ohio native with a penchant for all things noble, honest and good, 
and Tommaso Ciampa, an athlete whose win at any cost mentality has earned him the moniker of the Sicilian psychopath. Both had separate but equally hard fought paths through the early years of their career. I found professional wrestling and I instantly fell in love with it. It was something that I loved right off the bat. Uh, just the, the athleticism and the entertainment and the acting and everything in general just thrown into one. It was something that I immediately fell in love with and I immediately fell in love with Shawn Michaels. Okay. He caught my eye. Uh, he was just, he had so much charisma and he was so athletic and he was so just there. And I was like, man, this guy's awesome. And then I started watching WCW and I saw the cruiserweights like Jericho and Mysterio and Malenko and guys like that. And this, it blew my mind because I needed it and I wanted to be a part of it. So I started doing it uh, when I was eight years old. Gargano started his wrestling career in 2005, working for the hometown promotion of Cleveland All Pro Wrestling. Over the following years, Gargano worked for some of the top promotions on the American independent circuit, including Shikara, Dragon's Gate USA, Evolve, and Pro Wrestling Guerrilla. Titles which Gargano held include the Shikara Campeonatus de Piraeus, the Evolve Tag Team Championship, and DG USA's Open the Freedom Gate Championship, which he held twice, with his first reign lasting a record 873 days. During his independent time, Gargano also made appearances for national promotions, Ring of Honor, and Total Nonstop Action Wrestling. I was kind of an overweight chubby kid. When you tell your family that, I'm going to be a professional wrestler when I grow up. You look at the pictures of me growing up, obviously. I can see why they doubted me, I get it. I did not look like a professional wrestler, but my mum was such a big supporter. She would just make costumes for me and she would support me 110% and my dad used to have independent wrestling shows in the back of his parking lot because he had a catering company. So that was actually the first I set my foot in the ring. The first time I got into the ring though, I just knew that this is what I was made for. So if it wasn't for my parents supporting me and backing me, I can honestly tell you that I would not be here today. My wrestling name was Jag, uh, John Anthony Gargano, Jag. Tommaso's career also began in 2005 working locally in Massachusetts, most notably Chaotic Wrestling and Top Rope Promotions. He then got his first recognition in the WWE in late 2005, when he signed a developmental contract with WWE's OVW promotion, and even appeared on SmackDown television alongside The Undertaker. After this run with the company, in 2007, Champa headed back to the independent circuit with runs in notable companies like PWG and TNA. His most successful period at this point came when he started his illustrious run with Ring of Honor in 2011. Every pride has one. Ring of Honor no! has Tommaso Champa. Where? he won the Ring of Honor World Television title from Matt Taven. The paths of Gargano and Ciampa crossed numerous times on the independent wrestling scene and they struck an immediate connection. Opposites definitely attract and the two men could see the other's desire to make it to the top as a mirror of their own ambitions. By 2015, Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano had both made a name for themselves as highlights of the indies. Both men had enjoyed success in several companies and they began to draw the attention of the biggest brand in all of pro wrestling, WWE. Rumours began to spread in the locker room that scouts working for Vincent McMahon were surveying the independent wrestling world for new talent for their NXT brand. So when a Pro Wrestling Gorillas Vortex show in June, as the two men came face to face, they agreed to leave it all in the ring, in the hopes that they may stand out amongst an unbelievably talented roster. The start of the PWG match was one of a slow methodical tempo, with the build up to the contest consisting of both wrestlers acknowledging one another's skills. As the crowd began to buy into the story that these two performers were equally matched, both men began to increase not only the speed at which they performed their slams and dives, but also the ferocity with which their attacks were landed. As both men were allowed a chance to perform a host of technical suplexes and well choreographed reversals, we really got an opportunity to see what these experts could deliver when given the chance. The bout ended after Tommaso delivered a trio of finishers and was declared the victor. 
a truly great match, which not only showed the quality on display generally away from WWE, but also that Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano really could do it all. They fought as both rivals and teammates across the states, earning reputations as some of the hottest properties not signed to WWE contracts. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing this for a very long time at this point. I yeah. mean, we've been doing this each individually for 12 years. Uh, like I said, we, we were singles guys before we got here. Uh, I think mentally it's kind of different to be in a tag team. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of have to prepare a little differently that way. Uh, but other than that, I feel it's business as usual. Um, for me, I know that this was always a dream of mine. I know Tommaso, this is always a dream of his. Yeah. So when you're here, it's kind of like, okay, the work hasn't started. Like, the work hasn't started yet. It's just, Absolutely. you got here. You got your foot yeah. in the door. Now it's about showing the world what you can do. This all changed later in 2015, when the two men reportedly signed what is known as the elusive Tier 2 contract. Meaning, unlike most of the roster, they could perform on both WWE productions as well as independent shows around the world, allowing Gargano and Ciampa to fulfill their pre-arranged independent dates. The two men were paired together in the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic Tournament, where they defeated the team of Bull Dempsey and Tyler Breeze in their first round match, and lost in an intense yet short match to Rhino and then everyone squash at Baron Corbin. The pair were united in defeat and used the loss as a way to refocus and improve. On their last truly indie showing as a tag team, on December the 11th, 2015, Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa unsuccessfully challenged the Young Bucks for the PWG World Tag Team Championships. A classic multi-man match filled with excellent performances from all involved, outrageously inventive reversals and plentiful near pinfalls. It's available online if you haven't, it's worth checking out. Aside from the obvious and much lauded exploits of the Young Bucks, you can really see the chemistry between Tommaso and Johnny. The smooth double moves, their fluidity in and around the ring, it's clear that there's something special between the two at this point. Their new employers, WWE, seemingly agreed. When I did my tryout, I was told no, but then a few weeks later, me and Tommaso were contracted for the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, but it was one of those things where we did not have a contract at that time. We were just brought in on a random basis, we never knew whether we were going to be on the television or not, we never knew where we were going to show up, but I think that made things even more exciting, and it made fans want to see us even more because they knew they played a big part in our success. Every time you cheered, every time you chanted Johnny Wrestling, Every time you cheered for me or Tommaso, you were playing a big part in getting us that contract. The transition from Ring of Honor to WWE and NXT and, and, and just in general to get to here was more of just like, kind of like a gamble game of bet on yourself. You know, I, I say that a lot to guys when they ask me for advice or anything in wrestling. It's like, in this, this sport, you just have to have a, a certain amount of confidence. I have a theory that the harder your job, the more unpleasant your tasks, the worse your pay, the more grueling the schedule and the more tired you are, the more you bond with your peers, the more you understand each other's pain, the struggles and the problems that you're all facing moving forward. In many ways, professional wrestling is a dream job for many, but the brutal travel schedules, the injuries and the notoriously competitive industry makes wrestling one of the careers that takes the biggest toll on its workers. I only say this because it helps me to truly appreciate the friendships and bonds that wrestlers can gain whilst out travelling around the world, sometimes for years at a time, missing their families and in cities where they don't speak the language. Over the years, many athletes have commented on having a closer connection with their teammates, more time spent each other with their colleagues than with their families at home. I don't know how many times we've all been in the locker room and said, we can't believe we're all here doing this thing. We've all supported one another, some of us have known each other for 10 years and been around the world together. In a sense, we've grown up together and to be a part of the NX team together is truly special. 
They did just that, gaining more popularity with the Full Sail fans and rising quickly to receive a tag team title match at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 2 against the Mechanics, now known as FTR in AEW. In my opinion, match of the night. This tag match stole the spotlight and deservedly so. All four men put on an absolute clinic, a perfectly laid out breakdown of the tropes and preconceptions of tag matches. The perfect ebb and flow with the crowd simultaneously nervous and excited throughout the whole match. The mechanics played their part in the use of clever ring psychology with a mixture of back to basic style, no flips just fists and dastardly old fashioned heel work. Tommaso and Johnny put in every drop of effort that they had but still fell short. When the mechanics cheated to win, they lost the match, but gained even more determination as their bond had never been stronger. I've said the word dream come true a lot, but you dream of winning a title in WWE. A lot of people when they grow up watching WWE, they say that I want that to be me who wins the title, and to be able to win the titles against the Revival, especially coming after our match at TakeOver Brooklyn, especially like how well received that match was. I honestly believe that if that match at TakeOver Brooklyn didn't go the way it did, if it wasn't so overwhelmingly praised, if people didn't love that so much, I don't think the tag title win would have happened. So many things that went into this moment that went into that particular night. Especially for me, my mum was able to come, Candice was there, Tommaso's wife was there, we had our families there and got them to enjoy that moment with us. They have been a part of this as much as I have, so to do all of that and to win the titles, you can't play it any better. We bring out the best in each other. I think we're very competitive. Uh, I think it's what it really comes down to. Uh, whether it's dieting or training on the road or just getting in there and, and performing in front of people on takeovers or t television or, or live events, we're very competitive and it's an unspoken, I'm going to outperform you. And I think that's what made our feud pretty magical from Cruiserweight Classic to New Orleans to Brooklyn and, and, and so on. Even the, the tag stuff in DIY is we went out there every time just trying to outperform one another. Their new attitudes as a team led Gargano and Champa to proclaim themselves as DIY with the motto, do it yourself, no one will do it for you. They reversed their unlucky loss at the next TakeOver event in an NXT tag title match in Toronto. Champa and Gargano's crowning moment came in what could be considered match of the year for 2016 in any wrestling company. A two out of three falls match with the still dominant champions Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder, their rematch against the Mechanics. The emotion of this night still stands out, even amongst the plethora of amazing takeover moments in recent years. The two teams somehow managed to top their previous performance and fought in a near perfect display of just what the future of tag team matches could be in WWE. Innovation, brutality and emotion made this one of my all-time favourite multi-man matches and put all four men on the map with a much bigger audience. They showed that the last TakeOver's much appreciated clash was no fluke and more of a solidification that both teams deserved the attention that they were receiving at the time. I think uh, after TakeOver Brooklyn, we kind of, after we had that match, we were like, oh, we kind of have something special here with Revival. I think... Uh, our, our just our styles and everything about us just kind of meshed really well. And after we had that match in Brooklyn, we were going to two out of three falls in Toronto. And in that moment, looking around, like it felt really special. I always watch like the old WWE video packages, and you see like the crowd going nuts, and you're like, "Wow, that's amazing!" And to be a person that actually caused that <laughs> is mind blowing to me. To even be like, like for me personally, to be considered a match of the year in WWE. If you would have told me that was even possible, that's nuts. At San Antonio's takeover in January of 2017, Gargano and Ciampa's dream was cut short when their confidence got the better of them. Understandable, when you see just how well the two of them had been wrestling over the last few months, they had taken their foot off the pedal slightly and were in for a rude and painful awakening at the hands of newcomers, authors of pain. These two big lads, Ackerman and Razar, 
ran a mock over their competitors at the previous year's Dusty Road Classic tournament and easily earned their shot at NXT's biggest event of the year. When they turned up in Texas, they were focused, dedicated, and most importantly, fucking massive. They ran through DIY in a brutal squash and ended their run as champions. Tommaso and Johnny were hurt, they were embarrassed, but they didn't give up. DIY tried to recapture the titles in a three-way elimination match at TakeOver Orlando where Authors of Pain retained over both DIY and the Mechanics, which would be their last match in NXT before going up to the main roster in WWE. With Authors of Pain on top for the next few months and the Mechanics out of the way, the story was set. For the first tag team main event in NXT history, a ladder match at TakeOver Chicago, DIY vs AOP. A brutal match which saw Gargano and Ciampa seemingly taking the victory when they performed their patented meet in the middle with AOP caught in a ladder in the middle of the ring. Both men climbed the ladders and clambered for the belts high above, but Akam and Razar proved yet again that they were too much to be taken down by the pairing executing double power bombs onto both members of DIY and retaining their championship belts. After the drawn out battle with the bruises and welts evident on both Gargano and Champa's bodies, Champa snapped. He took his disappointment out on his best friend, smashing him around the ring and collapsing him through a table, leaving Gargano completely broken, both physically and emotionally. He was visibly saddened and confused by the action of a man who up until this point he had treated like a brother. Champa was a groomsman at Gargano's wedding, they shared a rare and close bond. So how did this happen? Why? You want answers? You did it to yourself, Johnny. Nearly a week before the show, Tommaso tore his ACL in a random house show match and some wrestling news sites imagined who could replace him in a marquee match at TakeOver. He pulled through and went to the show. During this brief spell of uncertainty, fans discussed online who could possibly replace Ciampa in DIY if he was unable to perform. Talk of dream matchups that complemented Gargano's historic outlook and gave him even better odds at winning NXT Gold once again. But Champa persevered and fought through injury at TakeOver. After the event and the aforementioned beatdown of Gargano, he took to the weekly NXT show to confront the audience and explain that he wasn't an afterthought. Champa was angry that they had been so quick to sideline him and move on, just 24 hours after hearing rumours of his injury. He only wanted the same things as Johnny Gargano, he had put in the same amount of hard work and travelled up and down the road, fighting in bingo halls and school gyms just like his former compatriot had. So why had the fans sided with Johnny wrestling over him? Tommaso took this moment to double down on his wrestling ethos of win at all costs. He explained how he had tried to fit into Johnny Gargano's mould and avoided using cheap tactics to win. He had been caring and considered in their thrown together match in the first Cruiserweight Classic tournament. At that time, both men took the honourable decision to kick to hurt, not to injure. Ciampa had done everything that we've come to understand as right and good within wrestling. At the end of the match, Tommaso had a chance to win when Gargano was seemingly injured. He had a chance to be more brutal, a chance to potentially injure his friend and most likely to win the title, but he didn't take it. He did the honourable thing and ended up losing to Johnny. Chemper explained that being nice in the eyes of society cost him the Cruiserweight Classic. And even in defeat after all of that, still the fans rejected him. He was now off for his unavoidable surgery but promised to come back as the baddest son of a bitch to reclaim his rightful spot on the roster. I swear I am justice. Kill me if you can. In the critically acclaimed anime series Death Note, one of the core principles which keeps a script to every single word throughout the story, 
the balance in intellect between the two main characters, both good and evil from one another's point of view. In the complex story, Light Yagami has the ability to cause anyone on Earth's death simply by writing their name down in, in an otherworldly book of death. L is the clairvoyant detective brought in to thwart Yagami's plan. The chase between the two men is what kept me captivated, each having different morals and skills to deceive and elude one another, the pair coming face to face in a few scenes which have your entire body tensed up, and although Yagami is a murderer, you can, in some aspects at least, see the situation from both characters' points of view. L readily admits, If you measured good and evil deeds by current laws, I would be responsible for many crimes, and if it means being able to clear a case, I don't play fair, I'm a dishonest, cheating human being who hates losing. That's the good guy in the story, remember? Leaving you caught up in the middle of one of the greatest criminal detective programs ever made, this dynamic of the equal can create a narrative where our antagonist and protagonist are close in the proximity of their lives, friends or indeed even family. A story that begins with two or more characters who trust one another, who have a personal and storied history have emotional connections which can far outweigh the bonds we see between the good and bad guys. It hurts in a story when we see our favourite character killed by the invading army of evil, crushed under the might of some all-powerful foe. However, doesn't it hurt so much more when we see the person we've rooted for all this time get stabbed in the back by a loved one? This closeness allows characters to know each other inside and out a benefit to those who would seek to manipulate their friends in order to achieve their own goals. After all, knowing what your enemy does best and what they are weak at is one of the most important ways to win in war. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. In pro wrestling, these feelings are the same. We know that the good guy is going to have to fend off countless villains in order to become the champion and we know that these villainous characters are going to try and lie, cheat and steal their way to victory. But when we see a tag team or faction who have travelled on the road for years together, shared meals and hotels together, when we see these bonds broken by one member who sets out for their own personal glory, this is when it can really hurt as fans. Johnny Gargano took this opportunity to put DIY behind him and whilst Ciampa was away, made strides towards success in his singles career in NXT. Take over New Orleans. I remembered exactly who Johnny Wrestling is. And I was ready to move forward. His first real test came against Andrade Cien Almas in a great opening match at TakeOver Brooklyn 3, where Gargano seemingly wasn't willing to take the step towards the dark side. He proved that even with the betrayal from Champa previously, he wasn't willing to continue with the chain of evil. Andrade certainly was. His manager, Zelina Vega, threw a DIY shirt at Gargano in the closing moments of the match, allowing Andrade the Hammerlock DDT to win the match. The memory of DIY still clearly haunting him, Johnny Gargano seemingly lost his determination, the attribute he had shown in abundance and that had up to this point held him in such good stead throughout his wrestling journey. He lost again to Andrade in a match where he was clearly second best. My match with Andrade, people went into it with tempered expectations, they knew it was good, they knew I was good, but I don't know if they knew that I could hit that main event level, I really wanted that opportunity. Gargano then suffered a defeat at the hands of then UK NXT champion Pete Dunne and started to slip into a terrible run of losses to the likes of Fabian Aikner, someone he would have routinely beaten not months prior. Gargano was dropping quickly towards the bottom rungs of NXT. He wasn't even considered for a number one contenders match for the NXT Championship when the opportunity arose. It was only when Velveteen Dream pulled out of his match with Cassius Ono through injury that Gargano was allowed a slim chance at redemption. Johnny went on to win the match, which propelled him to the number one contenders fatal four-way match with Killian Dane, Alistair Black and Lars Sullivan, which, through all the chaos and confusion, managed to get the win when Black was distracted by the Undisputed Era. Grabbing the opportunity with both hands, Johnny didn't give up. 
he did it for himself and he got a shot at the NXT Championship at the upcoming TakeOver. Philadelphia hosted one of NXT's greatest matches when Johnny Gargano faced Andrade Cien Almas for a third time at TakeOver, a modern day 5 star classic. Even if you're only a casual or passing wrestling fan, you may have heard of this match. If you haven't seen it, I'd recommend searching it out and watching it. If you've already seen it, go and watch it again. It's a moment of true beauty when Andrade and Gargano put on a masterpiece of wrestling magic that had fans and critics around the internet buzzing in delight. Both men seriously left it all in the ring and even though Johnny tried his best, even when Almas didn't cheat, he still beat Mr. Wrestling, who was left laying on the ramp defeated as his nemesis, the man who had promised to come back and changed it all, returned with fury and vengeance to beat down Gargano. This was it. For Johnny Gargano, he had given everything. He had stayed true to his beliefs of being good and honourable, and it had failed him. He had lost his closest friend and every title shot afforded to him. He had come up short and was victim to his own honest spirit. Broken and with nothing left to lose, Gargano offered to put his career on the line in exchange for one last title shot, claiming that if he can't win this, then he is undeserving of his NXT contract and should give up his space for someone else to have a chance. Gargano's demeanor had changed and he could not afford another loss. We have that that strange Triple H Shawn Michaels connection yeah. of uh Anytime we're on screen together, we feel it. Like it, it, there's that there's energy. It's, it's you can't put your finger on it type of thing, but it is, there's magic there. I think we're both well aware of it. Against Alistair Black in a steel cage match on NXT, as the steel cage was lowered and Alistair Black made his entrance, Johnny attacked him before entering the ring, igniting a fast-paced and aggressive brawl around the ring before finally entering the cage. Gargano wasn't here to be friendly, to win admirers, he was desperate, and you can see that when he clambers straight away to exit the cage for the cheap victory on several occasions, as well as trying to escape via the cage door, acting in every way as brutally and dishonest as those he had previously fought against, grating Black's face against the cage and cheap shutting him from behind when he got the chance. The match progressed until Black was crawling towards the cage door and Gargano had climbed over the top and was ready to drop down to victory. As Black attempted to make his last escape, a returning Tommaso Ciampa appeared and slammed the cell door in his face. He then entered the ring and drew the attention of Gargano as he climbed back over the cage. Johnny Gargano had lost his mind, he was as low as he thought that his career could go and he had rid himself of any morals. He was past the point of wanting to win, and as he and Ciampa stood either side of the ring, with Alistair Black kneeling in the middle, Gargano made his first steps towards the dark side of his character, combining for one of the most sickening meat in the middle knees ever. He had managed to save his career, but at what cost? For story reasons, my match with Chamaso Champa at TakeOver New Orleans, I don't think I'll ever be a part of an atmosphere like that. Like, ever. Just because I've never heard another crowd react to Tommaso, or a crowd react to another wrestler, like they reacted to Tommaso that night. Everyone in the building, literally everyone, from the front row to the tippy tippy top, everyone hated that man that night. During that era, it was insane. I remember sitting in Gorilla and watching his entrance and being like, oh my god, I've never experienced something like this before. All of the animosity, all of the hatred and jealousy led to this point. The two men whose journeys had taken them to NXT TakeOver in New Orleans, a match with too much hatred, too high a risk for WWE to ensure, as they assumed the two men would stop at nothing to see the others destroyed. The only fitting solution being an unsanctioned match. No rules, no limits, and no room for second guessing. I know I've said this a lot in this video, but this match really is a must see. If like me you are sick of taking my word for it, 
Here is internet wrestling community overlord Dave Meltzer's take on the match. Five stars. One of the best storylines in the history of NXT. Fans finally got to see Gargano and Ciampa face off after a year full of betrayal and injuries. This had a lot of hype coming in and boy did it ever deliver. This match was special. You could feel the hate between Ciampa and Gargano throughout the match. They told an awesome story and it will go down as one of the best NXT matches in history. The end of the bout was an emotional roller coaster, with Johnny proving that he was willing to give into his dark side, using straps and a crutch to batter and beat Champa before submitting him with Champa's own knee brace contorted around his face. Tommaso himself had been edging his way back to the honourable side of his character. In the match, he begged and he pleaded. He reminded Gargano of everything that the two men had been through together and recreated the scene where both men sat in the ring, a throwback to their match in the Cruiserweight Classic. Throughout the contest, Johnny was noticeably undecided. He held back on several occasions and was uncertain of whether he had what it took to defeat his greatest foe. Putting to bed his personal demands when he defeated Champa. But this wasn't the end. At least not from Champa's perspective. He was still on a mission to get to the top and he desperately wanted his success to be at the expense of Gargano. He challenged him to a street fight to settle the score once and for all, the winner going on to face Alistair Black for the NXT Championship. At TakeOver Chicago 2, the two men fought in a gritty and aggressive battle. Champa's returns and attacks had pushed his former ally over the edge and in a sick way through his cutting honest promos and devious manipulation had made Gargano more like himself. The two men now completely changed. This wasn't about grappling or technique. They wanted nothing other than to injure. There was no respect and no sportsmanship, and the progression from the Cruiserweight Classic had come full circle. Gargano had Champa's hands cuffed. He was defenseless and left at the mercy of Johnny's kicks and stranglehold. It took officials and security to break up the pair, fearing serious injury or worse if Gargano was allowed to continue his path of retribution. Gargano was pulled from the ring and separated from Champa, but as he entered back in between the ropes, Chimaso grabbed his head and slammed it full force into the previously exposed wooden ring boards, showing that because Gargano had given in to his demons, because he had allowed himself to be consumed with hatred, he had lost, granting Tommaso a shot at the title belt at the following takeover and his eventual first title reign. The story was then continued between Ciampa and Gargano as in the takeover main event, Gargano accidentally struck the champion Alistair Black with the title and allowed Ciampa to gain the pinfall and victory. A point of complete opposites in the saga of DIY, this was simultaneously the crowning moment of Ciampa's career coming back from an awful injury to realise his dream of becoming NXT champion and also the lowest point of Gargano's story so far, handing the title to a man whose ethics he disagreed with on a fundamental level. Even worse, he'd done so by behaving in the manner in which Champa would through interference in the match and cheating. Then general manager of NXT William Regal had had enough. He had tried to let the animosity between these men play out, commenting that he thought the rivalry would make gripping television for his brand, but the violence was too much. He wanted a way to put an end to all of the match interruptions and backstabbing, which in Regal's eyes was ruining his NXT brand. With Alistair Black in the mix, things only got more complicated when he demanded his rematch at his recently lost championship belt. Per the rules of WWE back then, William Regal granted Black his rematch and at the same time made it a triple threat, injecting Gargano into the affair. But as always, nothing is straightforward in wrestling. Alistair Black, just days before TakeOver, was brutally attacked in the arena car park and left injured and sidelined for a projected two months, meaning he would have zero chance of competing in a three-way in the days to follow. The blood boiled again as Tommaso and Johnny quickly forgot the misfortune of Black and treated the now one-on-one -on -one as the deathmatch that it had become. The story stayed the same and Johnny Gargano spent most of the match torn between doing the right thing and defeating his mortal enemy. 
Sometimes you have to give in to the darkness in hopes of becoming something more. Anger, suffering, rage, and hate. I wasn't the best of friends to him for a while, and, and I, I, I think I'm safe to say he wasn't the best of friends to me. In the aftermath of the match, fans and wrestlers alike were left wondering who attacked Alistair Black and cost him his title opportunity. Throughout the summer, clues came to light, all of which hinted at Champer being the culprit. It would have made most sense. Nothing personal, just Tomasa's will to win at all cost, rearing its head once again. Surely, it's easier for him to retain his title with one less man in the match. Months later, and Black's return led him to enter NXT, determined to find out who attacked him and get retribution. As he was about to call for Champa's head and proclaimed, I'll find out who did this, Johnny Gargano alongside him in the ring replied, I'm right here. In this second, Gargano revealed just how far he had gone, just how much he had changed and that now had been fully converted by his actions and the actions of Champa. He had lost the light and now lost himself. He was not regretful or filled with sorrow, but happy that he could now reveal his true self to the world and finally, in his eyes, reach full potential. The first true test of this new outlook came in the following match where Alistair Black sought revenge for his ambush at NXT TakeOver War Games 2. Gargano started off from the bell with no regard for the rules. He wanted to show that his new approach to life was going to let him win, and for most of the match, his already obvious in-ring skills, mixed with his new win at all cost persona, nearly had it in the bag. Maybe he was wrong all along, and he should have given up on the people a long time ago. It all seemed to be working out for him this time, at one point even countering a deadly black mass kick. Until he realised he must face the consequences of your actions, one way or another. Just as Johnny was about to win, Champa interjects and creates havoc at the end of the bout. A little down the line and Johnny got his first North American title match against Ricochet, while in the build up even reluctantly tagging with Champa against Black and Ricochet to promote their matches at the upcoming pay per view, becoming more and more confused and seemingly directionless as he still struggled to come to terms with his long-term foe, Champa. At TakeOver Phoenix, Champa beats Black and Gargano beats Ricochet while using similar evil means to achieve success. Tommaso feels that he has Gargano under his control in the ultimate Johnny not being himself moment. Shortly after this, Velveteen Dream defeated Gargano on NXT for the North American title proving that his past would come back to haunt him and that the evil deeds Johnny had been committing over the previous weeks would have a knock-on effect. Here is where Gargano finally starts to realise his wrongdoing and starts to actively show signs of regret. With a clearer eye, he could now see how he'd changed in the past and veered away from his core of being honourable. Tommaso realised now that if he let Gargano relinquish his evil and return to his former ways, that he'd be in his way. In this moment, Tommaso proved that he thought Johnny was better than him. He showed that he was worried about losing to Gargano, worried about the possibility of him losing the NXT Championship again if good guy Johnny was in his way. Ever the master manipulator, Jamper pleaded for forgiveness. He implored Gargano to see how much he'd changed. He played the pity card and wanted sympathy for all the injuries and suffering he'd been through whilst Gargano made his rise to the top. Champa played on the emotions of Gargano and persuaded him to reform their tag team for the upcoming Dusty Rhodes Classic. What better way to rekindle their friendship than in the tournament that first brought them together in WWE? A truly fitting way for the pair to move on from all the hatred and reconcile. All the while, Jampo playing the puppeteer and managing to keep Gargano's mind off the NXT Championship. The reformed DIY were knocked out by the eventual winners Ricochet and Black on their way to their WrestleMania debuts. At the end of the match, Gargano realised that he was being used. 
realized the plan that had been unfolding all around and withdrew from the tournament. Promising to enact his revenge, Gargano swore to never trust Champa again. The stage was finally set. Years of friendship, torn apart by greed and ambition, violence leading to the destruction of a brotherhood created over a decade, all brought us to one final match. Or so we thought. Johnny Gargano vs Tommaso Ciampa at NXT TakeOver New York, the biggest match of either man's career up to this point, and a definitive moment in NXT Championship history. Once and for all, we'd all know who's the greater man, which force, good or evil, would triumph, and which of these two athletes' intertwined paths would lead them to the ultimate glory. We've been able to make this a movie, a comic book come to life, Gargano said. People have been invested in the twists and turns, and we want to keep them guessing. All of us involved in telling that story are very proud of that. We've taken people on a great ride. Then, the devastating news came in. Champa must undergo life-threatening surgery on his spine. His wrestling career, for now, is over. Tommaso Champa, a man who had named himself the Master Puppeteer, took pride in his ability to control those around him, to control the outcome of his match and control the trajectory of his wrestling career. How painfully ironic that this part of the story comes to a close with an event that was completely out of its control. He was forced to vacate the belt and it was fought for at WrestleMania weekend by Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole. Uh, Adam Cole is right, there is strength in numbers, but there's only one Johnny Wrestling. In the penultimate chapter of this epic saga, Gargano pledged to not let Ciampa down. He wanted to prove that through everything, he realised that Ciampa was just like him. That they were still brothers in arms, and though their ambitions had led them astray, now all was said and done, and Gargano no longer needed to be held back by Ciampa's demons. Johnny Wrestling came to the floor that night, through integrity and self-respect, through his ability to recognise the good within himself and to rise above the hatred of Adam Cole and the Undisputed Era. Gargano defeated not only them, but that night he also defeated any evil left within himself. He won his first NXT Championship and stood proudly on the ramp with his wife Candice LeRae. This leads us back to the scene I described at the beginning of the video. When Ciampa comes out to give Gargano the recognition he deserves, he has admitted that he was wrong all along. He showed that Gargano and LeRae were his extended family and they regretted the way that he had betrayed them. Ciampa had stated from the start that the plan was for both members of DIY to become huge stars in WWE. He always wanted to do it together. His greed had blinded him and after he lost Johnny as a friend and the NXT title, he realised that his evil actions had left him with nothing. His seemingly career-ending injury, his new family at home, all reasons for him to reassess his life and try and make a change. He understood that for Ciampa to win the NXT belt, he had to lose his morals and respect. He had to go to the dark side. But that Gargano was able to do it without cheating was a signal that it could have been possible for him too all along. If I can do it, if, if a kid like me, if a chubby little eight-year-old kid who had a dream one day to be a professional wrestler can go and can main event in Barclays Center, any of you guys can do it. Trust me. He was proud that even though he couldn't get what he wanted, he could stand aside while Gargano got what he deserved instead. I see this more as Ciampa putting his family back together. He lived with Candice and Johnny. They were his NXT family. As far as Ciampa knew, he had a surgery that may shelf him forever and put him on borrowed time. He had time to spend with his child, who he treasures more than the belt. In character, this could give him perspective that he sacrificed two of the most important people on his journey, and the goal was always for both members of DIY to be huge stars. That dream came true for him in NXT at a questionable cost. Now, there's a chance for it to come true for someone who used to mean so much to him. Ciampa was happy to see that with everything they'd been through, Gargano was enough of a good person deep down to overcome it all. 
this gives Champa and hopefully all of us a little bit of hope. Protagonists and antagonists give us a form of mirror in storytelling, a reflection of one another which in some ways is exactly the same and in others is polar opposite. A great story which features these reflective characters is the J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. You may have realised whilst reading the books or watching the films that the two main wizards of the story are eerily similar in a number of ways. Gandalf and Saruman are both old, white-haired Englishmen, both with long flowing beards, grey robes and powerful magical weaponry. However, where they differ is their attitude towards infamy and power. Gandalf sets out to right the evils of the world from the shadows, guiding others towards the end of the narrative. Saruman seeks power and control, and when he's not given it naturally, he takes it through his powerful dark magic and allegiance to Lord Sauron. If we look further, we see how Samwise Gamgee and Gollum do not share the same visual similarities as the aforementioned wizards. After all, Gollum has been corrupted by the power of the ring and turned into his current beastly form by the time the characters meet. However, both men seek to protect Frodo and guide him on his journey. Both have passionate views about the world and are willing to do what it takes to get what they think is right. Even Frodo has a mirror, the ring. The two are a great example of an opposing mirror, whereby we see that Frodo wants nothing more than a quiet, safe life in the Shire and is willing to be a subservient and calm in order to bring peace to his little part of the world. The ring, however, is focused solely on power and destruction and corrupt all those who dare to wear it. By the end of the story, Frodo has become so tired and weak from his adventure that the ring comes close to overpowering him on a number of occasions. The two ideals coming closer together as we see that even the most noble of characters can succumb to the horrors of evil which wait across this thin line and onto the dark side. You just couldn't let me go, could you? He smirks at Batman. This is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. You won't kill me out of some misplaced sense of self-righteousness, and I won't kill you because you're just too much fun. I think you and I are destined to do this forever. This form of mirroring is also an incredibly clear way to understand the very thin line between good and evil, the fact that two characters who are on the surface so different can become almost indistinguishable from one another beneath the surface. Is permeable and almost anyone can be induced to cross it when pressured by situational forces. Man is not truly one, but truly two. After many months of recovery and rehabilitation, by October the 2nd, 2019, Champa made his long-awaited return in front of an expectant NXT crowd. What a jubilant feeling for Tommaso, who had suffered from horrendous luck with injuries and still managed to stay a fan favourite in his absence. With Adam Cole the then NXT champion, it only made sense for Ciampa to jump back on track to a title shot for a belt which he had never been beaten for. However, he was only one man and Adam Cole had the full force of the undisputed era behind him. Ciampa's only hope was to find an ally or two. The next week, Tommaso Ciampa reached out to his old nemesis Gargano, who agreed to aid in Ciampa's conquest for gold. The two men were surprisingly joined by a returning Finn Balor, as it just about seemed that the undisputed era had met their match. Balor turned to attack Gargano, injuring him in the process of delivering a brutal assault on the entrance ramp. Ciampa was left to fend for himself and suffered a beatdown at the hands of Adam Cole and his all-powerful faction. Gargano received a neck injury which would see him out for a few months, and the long-awaited reunion of DIY was on hold. A moment which, at the time, seemed so indicative of the way which this now historic feud played out. It seemed that just when these two men began to gather momentum, whether it be as a tag team or as bitter enemies, somehow something unforeseen would happen and rip the carpet out from underneath them. I appreciate that both Gargano and Ciampa had no control over these horrific injuries and the fact they have both been forced out of the storyline at crucial moments. And that must feel disappointing for two men who in my opinion deserved for this entire rivalry to play out in the orchestrated fashion which they initially planned. But that isn't the case and for me this brutal reality that everything doesn't always play out the way you want it to 
that nobody will give you an advantage in life and that you must work for everything you earn have been the key concepts of the DIY team right from the very start. It's poetic in both its rhythm and its tragedy. In January of 2020, with the future of DIY now hanging in the balance, as Tommaso Ciampa continued his feud with Adam Cole and the Undisputed Era, he once again found himself at their mercy in the middle of the ring. At the moment when he needed it most, Gargano came in to make the save and fend off Ciampa's attackers, the two men making a clear showing that after all they'd been through, they didn't want to fight anymore as foes and would continue on their path to tag team glory. One more time for old time's sake became the message of the match as, at the Worlds Collide event, the pair faced off against Moustache Mountain, who were representing NXT UK in a fantastic effort. DIY stood victorious at the end of what was a stellar display of multi-man wrestling, before embracing in a touching moment which signified the team's newly rekindled unity. Or so it seemed. At NXT TakeOver Portland in February, Champa was offered a chance to challenge for his much beloved NXT title against Adam Cole. As per usual, during the encounter, Undisputed Era were ever present ringside and began with their old routine of interfering and giving Cole the unfair advantage. Just as Champa looked to be overwhelmed, yet again his closest ally made his way to the ring and helped fend off the UE. This could be it. This could be the moment of redemption for Champa and his chance at a deserved moment of personal glory. With his best friend at his side, nothing could stop him, except his best friend. Gargano grabbed the title belt and swung it wildly towards Champa, sending him crashing to the ground. Mere months after the pair had reconciled, once again the friendship was left in tatters. A moment of betrayal towards Champa, which was only made worse by the fact that moments later, he was pinned and lost the match and his chance at the NXT belt. As the world began to lock down at the start of the 2020 pandemic, the wrestling world was still starting to adapt. Before the Thunderdome and all the clever tricks and tools WWE would go on to use in order to keep the show running, Triple H sanctioned an empty arena match as one final chance for these two men to settle the score. Champa and Gargano had been attacking each other and destroyed parts of the performance center as their rivalry boiled over. The story was clear. As almost a mirror of the entire narrative so far, now Champa found himself as the betrayed friend, and Gargano was now the ruthless manipulator. As the match was set, it became clear that the action would be pre-recorded and presented in a more cinematic style than the usual NXT in-ring work. There was a slow and methodical start to the match, akin to their very first bout way back in 2015. The pair brawled around the performance center and delivered a stunning set of moves, which included a brutal looking Willow's Bell onto the exposed wooden board beneath the mat. Gargano's wife and longtime conspirator interjected into the proceedings and betrayed her husband with a low blow, which seemingly took Gargano out of the match. However, in what can only be described as an unsatisfying ending, it became clear that Gargano was in cahoots with his wife the whole time, prepared for the groin shot by wearing a protective cup. This momentary confusion caused by Larray allowing for a victory for Johnny Gargano. The instance felt almost surreal as the entire feud was promised to end at this moment. In front of no fans, with no reaction, the match flickered out like a puff of smoke. Just as this great rivalry had begun, unexpectedly and in an instant, it was over. It was good versus bad and it was pretty clean cut, uh, which I, it's just, I love that style of pro wrestling. It's what I grew up on and I, I had a blast doing it. And then it feels like the back half of our feud became more uh, current day where it's not as clean cut uh, where good and evil it's like it's almost like it's just, it's just people who have good qualities and bad qualities and what are we focusing on at the time uh so it, it became just uh like very I, I i wish that that last match was in front of a crowd because i wish i could have heard who they were behind 
You know what I'm saying? I, I think that it would have been a split crowd, whereas that first matchup in New Orleans, it was pretty clear. You know, they, they were booing me, they were cheering him. In almost a century of pro wrestling, a form of entertainment filled to the brim with memorable and expertly executed rivalries, there's something so special about the story which Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano managed to tell. An exhilarating roller coaster ride full of emotionally powerful peaks and heartbreakingly unfortunate troughs. The modern world of WWE has many a detractor and a countless amount of online commenters willing to relay just what it is about the current product which they find so unappealing. However, one thing is undeniable. The unscripted, live nature of many of the interactions which occur on WWE's NXT programming and the unpredictable nature of life itself culminates in moments which, once captured by the studio's cameras and relayed to us as fans at home, can live long in the memory of many a grappling fan such as myself. Before Gargano and Ciampa joined WWE, they were never known for being a tag team. Their individual successes prove that. Nobody could have planned or predicted the chemistry which these two contrasting individuals would go on to share. Yes, the scheduling and outcomes of each and every interaction between the pair would be heavily scripted by those behind the scenes, but nobody could have expected for the feud to be ground to a halt due to so many untimely injuries. This has meant that now that all is said and done, and the sun has set for the final time on this tumultuous story, we are left with the knowledge that we've witnessed one of the most engrossing stories ever told within a pro wrestling ring, and a story which, because of the very nature of WWE, may only ever be possible within a wrestling ring. One thing is for certain, I feel privileged to have been watching NXT for this entire run, to be able to say that I saw these two men's narrative play out week after week, for years, is something myself and many other wrestling fans around the world must rejoice in. Because when pro wrestling's bad, it sometimes leaves us questioning why we even bother to tune in, but then this kind of story comes along and answers that question for us. Thanks for watching. Whether it's together, which I think goes pretty well, and somehow when we're when we're opposed to one another, it goes even better. Uh, we bring out the best in each other.